InFi, Episode 2. Welcome to InFi, the future of finance, hosted by American economist and author Dr. Robert Murphy. Each week, tune in for dynamic discussions with business pioneers about emerging trends in finance, life insurance, asset management, technology, and more. Now, let's talk the future of finance. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of InFi. Today, our guest is going to be Perry Metzger, who has numerous accolades. Reading from his LinkedIn account, he says, I'm a technology manager, consultant, and academic researcher specializing in computer systems and networking issues, especially those connected to software development, system architecture, and security. I also have a strong side interest in nanotechnology and molecular manufacturing. However, what we're talking about specifically in today's episode is Perry's interest in the debate over artificial intelligence or AI. And specifically, Perry is involved with the Alliance for the Future, which is an organization devoted to educating the public on the benefits of AI and in particular to try to forestall certain movements lately that have arisen that are trying to get the government to pass regulations or outright prohibitions on the further development of AI. So in this episode of InFi, Perry and I will just be discussing these various topics related also to concerns about are AI going to steal our jobs? Are they going to wipe us all out? That sort of thing. Important, weighty questions. And then, well, there's lots of risks. So what's the benefit of these things? You know, isn't it better to be safe than sorry? Right. So all these issues, and as you see, Perry is a very glib guest. So I was glad to have him on for the second episode of the InFi podcast. Without further ado, here's my discussion with Perry Metzger. Perry, welcome to the InFi podcast. Oh, thank you for having me, Bob. So I would have already given a little bit of your background in the pre-recorded introduction, but just for our listeners, can you explain how is it that you came to be so interested in AI? Uh, I got interested in AI decades ago as a student. It always struck me as being one of the most interesting problems in computer science. I'm a computer scientist. We know very well how to make computers do things that we can explain very precisely, things like adding numbers or putting text up on a screen or things like that. There's no problem programming a computer to fill in a tax form. Uh, because we have very precise instructions for that. Annoying instructions, instructions no one want, really wants to have to deal with, but precise instructions. But trying to do something like recognizing a picture of your mother or a cat or painting a picture of an elephant or things like that, those are things that all of us as human beings understand implicitly but can't actually explain. One of the things that makes AI interesting is that it's a way of getting computers to do things that that we understand relatively well or think we do, but don't have good ways of explaining to anyone. And so it seemed like a really fascinating area. But unfortunately, when I got interested in it, no one had the slightest clue about how to actually get it to work. But, you know, a fast forward 30, 35 years, and now we have good ideas about how to get computers to do these sorts of things. And so it's now become much more of an issue, both for people who are trying to deploy these things, both personally and in in business situations, and for people who would like to terrify all of us by uh, claiming that unless we regulate all of it immediately, we are all going to die. Uh, Or at least so certain people claim. Uh, I don't think we're actually all going to die. But, you know, I mean, I guess people have to have their fun. So, you know, it, it, it seemed like a really interesting topic. The other reason it seemed interesting to me was that I think it sheds some light on how human beings think and, and how they work. But again, that's probably more of personal interest to me than it necessarily is to all of your viewers. Well, we yeah, we may get into that. But um, it's funny, you the, the area of like visual recognition of things that reminds me, I read something years ago of the situation where I don't know if it was literally the Department of Defense or you know, the Rand Corporation or whoever, but they were trying to see if they could get the AI to help with reconnaissance. And so they had, a, and specifically, they were looking at area, I don't know if it was satellite photos or, you know, just an overhead plane, taking photos of like a jungle setting where they were trying to sh- get the computer to be able to just look at lots of photos and see whether there were enemy troops hiding and in, in camouflage in, inside the pictures. And so they trained it. And so they took a bunch, they had, you know, their own staged operation where they had their own troops and tanks and whatever with, 
brush on it and so forth and took a bunch of photos with those in there and then a bunch of photos of just the forest. And then they trained the you know, computer and told it, okay, this first batch, yes, this is, you know, if you see something like this, you flag it and tell us that there's enemy troops there and the other ones you know, say it's all clear. And they trained it and then they tested it on the same batch of photos, but out of sample. And the computer did great. You know, it didn't miss any that were there and it gave no false positives either. And then they decided, so, hey, okay, let's go take another batch of photos. And so they did the test again with a brand new batch and the computer flunked horribly and they were baffled. And it turned out that in the original training samples, it happened to be a sunny day when the, they had all the ones that did have the troops in there. And then it happened to be overcast on, the, you know, when they took the photos without it. And so the computer learned that, oh, what the military wants me to do is whenever it's a sunny day, tell them, yes, there's troops there. And when it's overcast, say no. So it had, you know, it, it just was a good example of showing how it, right, that to us, it was obvious, like what's relevant about these photos? What's the important similarity? But, you know, to the machine, if you're just training it in that crude way with brute force, that's not going to pick that up. Oh, yeah, there are, this is this sort of problem. I, I've never heard that particular incident, but this sort of problem is kind of a classic in machine learning. You can get things overtrained on the wrong features in photographs or sound samples or all sorts of things like that. But the thing that's interesting is that over the years, we figured out how to do this stuff better and better. It used to be it used to be pretty bad in these days. We actually can do this stuff remarkably well, which you know, it's gotten to the point where, you know, you can have voice recognition systems that can understand, that can transcribe human speech to text far better than any human being can. Image recognition systems that are, you know, have very, very low error rates, that sort of thing. And it's been a question of feeling our way through the problems of building such systems and making enormous numbers of mistakes over the course of decades, after which, of course, it's all been an overnight success, right? Mm -hmm. you know, everyone got interested in this, I think, because in the fall of last year, OpenAI released the ChatGPT model, and suddenly everyone saw instantly, you know, so from out of nowhere being, you know, decades of hard work, suddenly these systems were capable of doing very interesting things, like having... English conversations with people and being able to write poetry on demand and that sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of difficulties people have had over the years. Machine translation systems used to be absolutely awful in their early days. I mean, there were experiments in the 1970s. There's one, I'm sure it's apocryphal, but it's a funny story anyway, where, you know, someone ask the machine to translate out of sight, out of mind into Russian. And when it translated back from Russian into English, reputedly, it came back with invisible idiot. Um, <laughs> but uh, things aren't like that anymore. I recently had to deal with a workman who didn't speak English. And I didn't speak Brazilian Portuguese, but the AI on my phone, and almost all of us now have translation AIs on our phones, even if we are not aware that they're installed, was more than good enough for me to be able to communicate with the man, which is impressive. Uh, all of us are using AI every day these days. We don't think about it very much. We don't think of voice recognition systems uh, as AI. We don't think of the system when we get into our car that navigates us to our destination as being an AI. It's an AI. We don't think of the thing that recommends that if we liked the last, you know, 15 shows we watched, we might like one of these other shows as being AI. But all of these things are AI of various kinds. Uh, can you maybe it's become just, ubiquitous now. Yeah, maybe can you give the listener a, a, a definition of sorts, even if it's just like a working one, but just because it's not simply that anything a computer does is AI, right? So can you just give an idea, like why is it that the GPS or the re recommending restaurants based on your history and so forth why is that AI? So, so it isn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be AI, but the way that people have implemented things, it's not that the GPS is, is AI, it's that the system that tries to figure out what the best route from where you are to where you want to go is run by AI. And, and the reason for that is that people figured out that AI systems did a much better job than cruder mechanisms that they had. There are ways to do this without AI. There are ways to plot routes, you know, using, using parts of computer science like graph theory that most people outside of computer science don't care about. Generally speaking, my definition of AI, and I know there are lots of people who will probably quibble with this, but my definition of AI is getting a computer to do things that human beings understand intuitively but cannot describe. 
and recognize it. How do you recognize your children or your mom when you see them? You can't actually explain it. You know, you can try explaining it, but it turns out as soon as you try that, you know, that you get bogged down in details you don't even understand about how your own brain works. Recognizing human speech and turning it into and transcribing it into text, being able to do things like writing a poem. I can explain to a student how, but, you know, truthfully, 95% of the way that people write poems has to do, you know, is is kind of inexplicable to even to people. So w- getting a computer to do things that involve a modicum of sophistication and intelligence that we cannot explain particularly well to other human beings even, that strikes me as being the best working definition these days. And there's another level of that, which is the thing that scares all of the fear mongers who are out there trying to convince us that it's important to regulate the stuff as quickly as possible, which is building systems that can do anything human beings can do. That's called, in the parlance, artificial general intelligence. Most of the AIs we've built so far have very, very narrow areas of applicability. You know, they transcribe text, they they help you navigate, they draw pictures in response to text being typed in. But there's an assumption that in the long run we'll build AI systems that are that have much more general capabilities. And, and so people speak about artificial general intelligence as well. But AI in general, it's getting a computer to do something fuzzy. At least that's the way that I think of it. Okay, so as far as the AI to AGI transition, the idea is that you know, for a long time now, computer engines can kill humans at chess, but you're not worried about the chess engine taking over the world because those are different types of tasks and you can I'm, certainly I'm not solve. worried about AGIs taking over the world either. Well, I know you're not, but I'm just saying like the people the, where we're, you know, I'm, I'm building up the case for the fear monger so that you can then knock it down. But okay. just to understand the distinctions between like AI and AGI, and, and I know there's expert systems like being systems trained to like watching videos of brain surgeries so that eventually, you know, you couple the the artificial intelligence system with a, you know, robotic hand that holds a scalpel or whatever and that the machine can go ahead and do that. But that particular thing wouldn't be good at playing chess because that's not what it's trained to do. But whereas a human being, and even there, it's a little bit misleading because it's not that any one individual human is phenomenal at chess and brain surgery. It's different human beings, or maybe. <laughs> but so anyway, even there, it's a little bit loaded in favor of humanity when we think like, oh yeah, the machines can do these one-off things, but we humans can do everything. It's like, well, not any individual. So even there, we're being a little bit unfair to the machines. Yeah, my, but, my ability to ballet dance is pretty limited. <laughs> yes, yes. You're a little false humility there, I'm sure. So, I, but do I have the idea right that that's, so the AGI means it's like this thing is kind of a general computational machine, like it it, it has a broad-based intelligence? Yeah, the idea of AGI, I think roughly, is something, so so the things that are kind of the first hints of things like that are, are systems like ChatGPT. Right. Mm-hmm. Where you can talk to it about anything, basically. And ChatGPT isn't really an AGI. It, I, I, If you've played with it, it's very impressive for a few minutes, and then you realize that it can't remember what you were talking about a few minutes ago, because it's got a very, very limited window of things that it can remember. It's sort of a trick, the way mm-hmm. that it works. But it, nonetheless, it can do quite impressive things in spite of the fact that, it, to some extent, it's a trick. And I think that when people think about AGIs, they're thinking about systems like that, except far, far, far better which you could have an unlimited length conversation with, or where you could ask it to write a novel mm. and not just a few paragraphs. And right now right. you can mm. you can use a system like ChatGPT and you can easily ask it to write a couple of pages of text, but you can't ask it to write 500 pages of text because by the time it gets to the end, it will have forgotten what it wrote at the beginning, which is not something human beings do. Presumably in the future, we will build better systems that are capable of doing things like that. And when people talk about AGI, that that's vaguely the sorts of things that they start thinking about. Something that is capable of doing complicated tasks like engineering or hosting podcasts, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. you know, guest being a guest on a podcast. Presumably neither of us will be necessary given good enough artificial intelligence. I'm being a little sarcastic there. I mean, things that are capable of doing anything that a human being can do, or at least anything that a normal human being can do 
are generally speaking artificial general intelligence. And then people, you know, certain people, especially among the fearmonger crowd, talk a lot about super intelligences, although to some extent we already have them in narrow areas. No, the chess computers are better than any human being at playing chess, but we still have people who play chess even professionally, in spite of the fact that the computers can do it better. Yeah, yeah. So let me push a little bit sort of like on the philosophy of it just to get your big picture views. And then, yeah, we'll get into the the more nitty gritty details of, of like the, the concerns people have and you know, the economics of it and whatnot. But I'm just wondering, like, so when you said there a minute ago, a few times you said, like with ChatGPT, after a while, it can't remember was the verb you used, what it said originally. I think there are some people who would object and say, what you're anthropomorphizing. It doesn't, what do you mean remember? Like you're making it sound like it's alive and even I don't know. I mean, are you in oral language? I mean, maybe the two of us are only simulating. Remember? Well, well, yeah, exactly. So that's what I wanted to ask you about. Like, do you have a, a strong view one way and the other of that? That because you, you're right. For some people, it, it's purely mechanical or functional, and just saying no. If it produces the behavior of an intelligent thing, then it, you will. You can't deny. You know, sort of like going back to the Turing test. I think there there are a lot of people who get. Mm. I think, and I use this term loosely, but there are people who get very religious about this in ways that I think are not very useful. You can have play definitional games all day long, and I think that worrying about the definition of words or over-parsing them is, it, it, it's one of the crudest forms of argumentation out there. No, it's not really intelligent. It, you know, well, what, what does that mean? How do you, if you can't define intelligence in the first place, how do I determine what is and it isn't? And if you're going to define intelligence as only being what human beings have, then what happens when we meet aliens? And, you know, are they defined as not being intelligent because they're not people, or at least not human beings? I think that worrying about, like, over-parsing and overthinking that stuff gets to be stupid. From my point of view, if the thing acts intelligent, and, you know, I mean, if it's capable of doing electrical engineering, then I can use it for doing electrical engineering. And I'm not going to worry too much about definitional arguments about what intelligence is. Yeah, it, 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 again, and there's so many topics where you can, where you answer the question by how you pick the definition. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see that as being particularly useful here. I can pick a definition that either says that human beings are the only intelligent things or that includes computers. It's kind of hard to pick a definition that teases the one apart from the other. Yeah, but So um, on the chat GPT, I'm just curious, since you said you've been in the field for so long. So me personally, I used to play computer games when I was like in the late 80s, let's say, and you, you interact a little bit and it would be things like the dialogue of, you know, you type in plain English, commands to, and it would tell the, you know, the character what to do. And it was very crude and you could tell probably how it was working under the hood was like, for example, if you typed in a swear word, it would say, do you kiss your mother with that mouth? That sort of thing. So clearly it just had a bank of naughty words and that's how it, you know, it's not that yeah, I was these were very crude systems right. by modern standards. Whereas now, like, yeah, chat GPT, especially what is it? Is it 4.0 that they're up to now? The, the most recent GPT four is is the most recent model that opened. Yeah, the, yeah, so that many one. Other, there are many other companies with many other models. Okay, sure. Yeah, so I'm just saying because the three point five was fairly impressive, but I saw, but then the four was really surprising me. Like I, it, it really, you know, I would not have predicted five years ago that they would have something that could do what that thing does. Yeah, and it'll probably get only better. Oh, I'm, I'm sure, certainly. So I'm just, I'm asking you to like, are you, were you surprised? Like people in the in the industry. Five years ago, did you think at this point it would be as good as like some of these latest versions? Okay, so there are two ways to answer that. On an intellectual level, I assumed that it would get to here. Mm -hmm. on, a, on an emotional level, it's kind of hard always to parse what that means. And in the late 1980s, just doing a back of the envelope with trends in computer power and the size of computers and how much electricity computers were used and what displays on computers were like. I actually told a friend that I assumed that eventually we'd all be able to fit supercomputers in our pockets with beautiful high-resolution displays. And if you'd ask me to predict, you know, a, uh, a, a, a an, you know, an iPhone or an Android phone or what have you and what that meant or that Twitter would be there and people would spend all their day on it and all sorts of things like that. I, I never could have. So, you know, there's there's the intellectual side of the prediction and then there's the kind of the human emotional understanding. And on the intellectual side, I assumed, yes, that things like this would happen. 
that they had to happen eventually. But in terms of what it might mean for society, I had relatively crude ideas. And I had also had relatively crude ideas about how we would achieve this sort of thing and what it meant. I assumed, for example, at one point, maybe 30 years ago, that if you were going to have something that was capable of doing what ChatGPT does, that it would have to be conscious. Mm -hmm. And ChatGPT is most certainly not conscious. And in retrospect, this is an obvious sort of thing that you could build such a thing without needing that. But at the time, it was not so obvious. Anyway. Okay, well, your answer, okay, so that's kind of what I thought too. I mean, I, I wouldn't have put it in those words, but yeah, I think we're hitting the same thing that I, if you had explained to me five years ago, the structure, the mechanics uh, under the hood of what these large language models do, I would not have predicted that Oh, yeah, with enough parameters, it'll produce outputs like that. I just would have I would have probably predicted that with enough parameters, it might be able to. Um, okay, well. Probably, I probably wouldn't have absorbed all of the, all the detail, shall we say. Okay, okay. And, and right. if I had at the time, you know, I would have, I would be very rich now because I probably would have gotten there first. But anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> so why don't we at this point, yeah, switch to, because I know that one of your, tasks or goals these days is to diffuse the hysteria and the fear mongering, you know, in, in your view over AI and super AI in particular. So for example, I think some of the listeners probably know there was an open letter that a bunch of researchers and others in this field took out and said, hey, 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 let's have a moratorium on further research in AI that let's just take a pause, like a six month or whatever the number may be. I'm sure that the People's Liberation Army was, you know, considering that very carefully. You know, it was on the point of agreeing mm -hmm. before they decided not to. But anyway, go on. Yes. So, yeah. So one could say, yeah, what's, Perry, what's the harm with something like that? Let's at least take a pause to, to really think through the ramifications of, you know, because there's lots of changes these things are going to unleash. There's things we don't even know these are going to do. So why... Why not just take a pause before we well, unleash all, these things? First of all, we won't know any better in six months, right? Or in 10 years. The, there are a lot of things which you only figure out by doing them. I think that no amount of deciding to take a pause, say when the internal combustion engine was invented, would have predicted things like the patterns of suburban traffic that we experience today or the fact that we would ultimately find ourselves developing a car culture and then abandoning it or all sorts of things like that. It is impossible. When the internet was young, I don't think that anyone would have anticipated, you know, social media or all sorts of other ramifications there. And you could have paused the internet for 700 years to allow, you know, self-appointed experts to think about it and, and to try to think about what the societal impacts might be and how we might prepare for them. And they never would have figured anything out, right? Mm -hmm. Because all of these are emergent phenomena that are too complicated for human beings to predict. So on the, on the one hand, there's the question of what good do pauses do? And the answer is they don't do any good because you're not going to make any progress in attempting to predict anything or in trying to figure something out after a while. And they do do some good for people who are interested in regulatory capture, right? If you're interested in trying to slow down competitors or get yourself into a position where you can catch up with incumbents in a field, ways of kneecapping the incumbents are often kind of economically valuable to you. I mean, there's all sorts of regulatory capture reasons why you might want to impose AI regulation in order to improve the profitability of your company. But if you're talking about like what the societal benefit would be for something like that, there's none. You can wait six months, you can wait 700 years. You're not going to predict all of the ramifications. You're not going to figure out how to do this differently or better or in a way that's, that, that changes the way that it affects human beings. Not going to happen. But there's also the other side of this, which is what sorts of harms does it cause? And the answer is twofold. First of all, I worry a great deal about getting ourselves into a world where the only people who have access to AI are the worst possible people, which is to say things, you know, dictatorial governments, military uses of various kinds. And there's going to be military uses of AI, right? One particular nightmare I mention a lot in conversations like this is, you know, imagine what happens in the future if the Chinese military has 
AI warfighting machines and the United States or other countries don't. And so long as everyone has them, by the way, you've got deterrence, right? I, I, th I think there are people who undersell the value of deterrence and undersell, for example, the reason we didn't end up in a nuclear war during the Cold War. And it wasn't because human beings were particularly wonderful. It's because everyone involved on all sides had the weapons and everyone knew if the other side used them that they would. And there are people who are aghast about this. But it actually produced, the balance of power produced peace for many, many decades. Well, in the future, we're going to have AI fighting machines that are going to be used in warfare. And if everyone has them, they probably aren't going to be used very much. And if only one group of people has them, they're going to use them immediately because there will be no response. So one possible result of a lot of the people who are saying that people in the United States and in the West should stop doing AI research is that we might end up with the PLA landing on the shores of Taiwan with autonomous fighting vehicles and with the West saying, well, you know, too bad. I suppose the Taiwanese will just have to succumb to Chinese rule. That's an extreme case, but there's lots and lots of, of even smaller things, right? Every month we delay AI-based drug discovery programs. We are delaying the cures to all sorts of diseases. Every day that we delay AI systems figuring out ways to produce better crops is a day that some people in the third world will starve to death. Now, I know there are many people who don't care very much about cancer patients or people who go hungry or this sort of thing. But, you know, to me, I think that delaying economic progress of various kinds has a real cost. There's a thing that, that I think people underappreciate, which is that AI gives us an opportunity to finally get out of the economic doldrums we've been in in decades, for a lot of decades now. Mm -hmm. uh, economic growth used to routinely be well over 5%. And for a very long time now, we have struggled to get it in the 2.5% range. With AI, we may be able to get economic growth back above 5% and even perhaps way above 5%. And the reason for that is that AI unbounds one of the biggest problems we have in our society, which is the limited number of minds and sets of hands that we can apply to solving problems. Should I go into that actually for a minute? Like why well, yeah, so, AI is, is potentially really, really important to us economically? Yeah, definitely. So let me just make sure that the listeners are catching. So in, in response to the people say, hey, let's just do some common sense, slow down, take a breathing period. You sort of had a twofold response. On the one hand, the, the benefits they're claiming from that are non-existent because however long we pause, we're not going to know the full ramifications of what we do until we actually do it. And then also, even if you're worried about nasty applications being developed, well, the worst thing we'd want to do is all the ethical people who are really hemming and hawing about, I want to do the right thing, not going forward and developing it, whereas the people who don't care about societal welfare, if they're going in and developing a full blast, that's not a good equilibrium either. And then the flip side you're saying is there's a definite cost to delaying. It's, it's sort of like saying, why don't we delay research and science? For six months, let's just put science on hold for six months. That would no one and would science think that could do terrible idea. things. Should right, we pause right. science mm -hmm. for a few years so that we can, you know, yeah. we already have so much science. Shouldn't shouldn't right, we be right. thinking hard mm -hmm. about the science we already have and what and the terrible things science might do in the future? I and mean, it's the right. same thing. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay. So yeah. So now just turning, focusing more specifically on the benefits that it's not simply that. Oh yeah, it's kind of fun that you can ask ChatGPT to do a rap in the style of Eminem talking about my history paper. Like it's, there are other real concrete ways that this can help humanity that we're just on the cusp of unleashing. So yeah, can you talk a bit about oh, yeah. that? Now, since the dawn of time, what has been the major thing slowing economic growth? Uh, and it has always been the number of minds that you can apply to any given problem. The amount of effort that you can push put behind any problem that you need to solve. Our ancestors weren't stupid, right? They weren't different from us cognitively. If you go back several thousand years, the people that lived then could have been taught anything that the people now know. But the population was vastly smaller, and the pool of available information was smaller, and the amount of labor, intellectual labor, that could be applied to things was vastly smaller. 
And there, there are people who talk a lot about AI producing unemployment, which is a ridiculous idea. It stems from the lump of labor fallacy, the idea that there's a fixed amount of work out there and that, you know, and you only have so much work available. And if there are people already doing all of that work, then new people will have nothing to do, which is garbage, right? There are an infinite number of things that any given person would like to be able to do and just doesn't have time to do. If you had the time, you would actually go in and renovate your basement. You'd finally fix the knocking sound in the heating system or do dozens of other things that you don't have time to do because you have to earn a living and because your kids are are screaming for dinner and other stuff like that. Um, and this is true on a larger scale, on a, on, on a society's wide scale, right? What keeps cancer research going slow is the fact that there are limited numbers of researchers and there's limited amounts of resources that we can apply to doing cancer research. If you could vastly, if you could follow every single lead that you get, even the extremely unpromising ones, you'd learn much faster, you'd make much faster progress. What slows the development of computer software, right? It's the limited number of programmers out there. You can imagine all sorts of programs that you would want on your computer or things that you would want the software on your computer to do, and you don't get them because there is a limited number of computer programmers, and the computer programmers are expensive and they're being used for particular tasks right now. I, mean, I could go on down the line, everything from... Why is it that no one has fixed this process in my company to why is it that this website looks so terrible? You know, anything you pick, we're almost always constrained on labor and broadly construed. Well, now we're going to be in an era where we're no longer constrained by labor. And this is astonishing and wonderful, right? Suddenly you're in a situation where any dream you have, you can ha get enough labor to apply to it, right? You want to, you know, you think to yourself, I really, really hate the way this piece of consumer electronics works. I wish it worked another way. Well, now you'll be able to hire huge teams of AIs to work to build the new one that does the things you would prefer and programmers to write the software for it. And people often crudely think, oh, well, you know, if we have AI electrical engineers and we have AI medical researchers and we have AI attorneys and we have all these other AIs, there won't be any work for people. But really what happens is that when you drive down the costs of many of these services and, and make things more available, suddenly people start doing things that they never would have imagined doing before. If aluminum is more costly than gold, then you'll end up in a situation as we did in the early 19th century, where Napoleon served his most honored guests on aluminum tableware. And the reason he used aluminum tableware was because it was incredibly expensive. But you make aluminum really cheap, and you don't eliminate the market for aluminum. The five people who were buying aluminum before don't buy their small amount of aluminum and there's the end of the market and, you know, and no one makes any profit anymore. No, suddenly aluminum gets used in all sorts of applications. It gets used for wrapping food. It gets used in aircraft. It gets used in electrical. It gets used everywhere because suddenly because that particular thing costs very little, you have the opportunity to use it all over the place. I know lots of people who are hand wringing about all of the world's artists becoming unemployed because of AI generated art. Well, I've been putting AI generated art to illustrate a blog that I run. Mm -hmm. I would never have hired an actual human artist to do any of the art for the blog because I couldn't have afforded to. There would have been no way to pay for it. And so it simply wasn't a thing I would have done. But now we're in an era where art can be plentiful, where people can use art in all sorts of places where they wouldn't have used it before because they couldn't have afforded it before. Computer design of farm equipment, research into better antibiotics, whatever you name, up until now we have been constrained by how extremely expensive and rare the talents needed to do that were. And now we're going to be in a situation where it's plentiful. And fools will say, oh, no, now all of the artists are going to starve. They're not going to starve. They will. There will be plenty of work, even for people doing art, 
like they do now going forward. But suddenly we're in a situation where you can make far more art and people who could not afford art before could use it. Now we're in a situation where even extremely well-financed pharmaceutical companies could not afford to put in as much effort as was needed into finding new antibiotics, new antivirals, et cetera, as we would like. And now they'll have the capability. This is going to transform society. The crude way to think of this, the way that economists would think of this, it's not crude when economists think of it, but you know, normal people, when they think about economic growth, it seems like some sort of vague idea. Why do we need more economic growth? Who is more economic growth going to help? Isn't the only thing that grows forever a cancer? Isn't it bad that we have more economic growth? They, they don't think about it clearly. What more economic growth means is that we're all richer, that we all live longer, happier, healthier lives, that we have more of the things that we want. And increasing economic growth, even just a couple percent, would transform all of society. And I think it's going to be much more than that. And that's a really good reason not to slow down on this stuff, but rather to accelerate. Yeah, well said. As uh, you resonated, um, just the other day, somebody was asking me, I had a guest for a different podcast with an economist on talking about this collection of essays that he put And someone emailed me and was asking me about it. And I said, oh, well, I just wanted to let the world know because this guy's work I've often said, if I could clone myself, the area that this guy's publishing papers and that's where I would, but I just, I haven't had the time to get hip deep in the, that's what I'm saying, the here, but it's, yeah, if I could outsource a lot and the same thing too, like people who know, like, like professors who have research assistants, like that's what it is, you know, the kind of thing where they supplement what you're doing. So certain things that you can outsource, they go ahead and do it. So you end up publishing more. So yeah, here it's um, the analogy I use for people who watch the Marvel movies is like Tony Stark in his house creating stuff. He's got his AI system that, go do this. Let me, okay, show me the molecule and rotate it. And he's just, and it's not that the machine puts Tony Stark out of business. It's that it amplifies and makes him able to, you know, makes him a thousand times more productive than he would be even using a computer, but with, didn't have a little AI personality helping him. So. Yeah, well, so, all, so many of the most important inventions in human history have been sorts of intellectual leverage of various kinds. The invention of writing, you know, on the one, it was originally invented just to keep business records, right? I mean, the earliest cuneiform tablets we see were people were recording things like Joe bought five amphoras of olive oil from Fred at this cost or what have mm -hmm. you. But they very probably quickly, weren't named Joe and Fred. No, they were, they, they, <laughs> they, 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 they probably had names more like, you know, El Nasir or what have you. But anyway, the thing is, though, that people very quickly discovered you could store knowledge by writing. Mm -hmm. You could convey knowledge to other people. You could avoid forgetting things. You could learn things and never have them vanish. When we talk about computers, you know, computers, I, I think Steve Jobs famously referred to them as being eyeglasses for the mind, right? Huh. There are all sorts of things you can do. With, you can write so much faster because the process of editing what you write is much simpler. You don't have to painstakingly type a draft and then painstakingly. I mean, I'm old enough to remember having to do that, right? And that was a pain in the in you know in the posterior, mm -hmm. uh, avoiding using words that your podcast might not like. But you know, now we have word processors. We have CAD systems that allow engineers not to have to draft and redraft and redraft. But you know, and they do more than what your drafting table allowed you to do, right? No typewriter complains about grammar or spelling problems, right? And your word processor does. But the internet has allowed us to be vastly more productive by allowing knowledge to be spread faster, to allow communications to occur faster. Podcasts did not exist without the internet. With something like Wikipedia or Google, a smart person even if they can't afford a research assistant, has a crude research assistant available. What you used to need days and days and days of library work to do, you can do very quickly with the internet. AI is all of this, but more. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be an incredible boost to our society. And so naturally, there are people terrified of it that want to stop it as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like one, just one specific example, and I've heard you on other shows talk about different ones, even beyond the, what you mentioned here in passing. But I don't know if you saw this, Perry, but Tucker Carlson was being interviewed and someone asked him about self-driving cars or trucks. And he was, oh, I would have all those in a heartbeat. Think of all the good middle-class jobs that that would be throwing out, you know, people throw out. And to me, it was like, are you out of your mind that 
for one thing, if it, you know, once technology gets good, how f- many fewer traffic fatalities there will be. So there's a bunch of people yeah, well, that they, won't they, the be dead. To 50, yeah, the 30 <laughs> to 50,000 people a year whose lives will be saved. We don't have to think about them. Yeah. But of course, we could go further than this. Why doesn't Tucker want to ban, you know, farm equipment? Because imagine all the jobs we would have if right. people had to hand harvest grain, right? Good middle class jobs working out in the hot sun with a manual scythe trying to harvest mm. wheat. And we'd get vast numbers of additional jobs that way, right? Would also destroy our society. But we'd have all these wonderful new jobs. Imagine how many jobs we could create by banning cars and making people haul around goods. In fact, we could ban animals for transportation either and make people haul goods up and down the roads, you know, on little wheeled carts, you know, using... That you know, painstakingly right. pulling things around, there'd be vastly so the oxen don't steal our jobs. Yeah, you, you don't, don't want, want those the oxen to steal our jobs or the horses. Yeah. The horses <laughs> are stealing the, the all of the jobs of good rickshaw pullers, right? Right. And if, yeah. you know, this is silly. I mean, yeah, of course. Every time we invent something like this, there are changes in employment. I, there is not unemployment. There's changes in employment, and the people who currently drive cars would have to find, you know, for a living, would have to find something else to do. And everyone else in society suddenly becomes vastly more productive and happier. Because not only do they not have, not only do we have fewer accidents, but if you're commuting somewhere an hour each way, you can sleep or eat or do work during that hour. You don't have to think about it anymore. Suddenly, if you want to send your kids to school, you can put them in the car and the car drives them to school. You know, so you can do something else with that 30 minutes. There's all sorts of things you suddenly have time to do because your time has been liberated by the existence of self-driving cars. And so naturally, of course, Tucker wants to ban them. I mean, this is the story throughout history, right? You know, we've got the people get frightened of the things that make our lives so much better. And we all live like kings these days, right? I mean, you know, did Louis the Fourteenth have the ability to get fresh blueberries in January? No, he did not, right? And you and I can just go down to the supermarket anytime we want. It's not even expensive. In terms of labor hours, even someone who's earning minimum wage can, for a fraction of an hour's wage, buy a package of blueberries in January. So that person is living better than kings hundreds of years ago imagined. AI is the same thing. We can get frightened and attempt to keep the world from progressing and feel the pain of that, right? Or we can move forward into a world that's vastly richer than we imagine. I mean, it, we have very little sense. I mean, so, so you and I are old folk. So you might remember that when you were a kid, and when I was a kid, I was uh, my family was pretty well-to-do, and my mom put patches on my pants when I would wear them through, right? Because Mm -hmm. everyone did that. And people would darn socks because if socks were, if you wore a hole in socks, it was, you know, it was useful to put it uh, to, to repair them because a pair of socks cost a lot of hours of labor. And now how much does a package of 12 socks cost uh, of 12 pairs of socks cost at Walmart? Nothing. No one, not even a really poor person is going to repair a pair of socks. We have very, we have such poor memories that we can't even remember in our lifetime what economic growth has brought us. And so, of course, we have trouble projecting forward. But imagine as an economist rather than as a normal person, you know, because, you know, as an economist, one is unfortunately not a normal person. It doesn't think about the world the way normal people do for good or ill. But imagine what would happen. Let's be really think fantastically. Right now, we have 2.5% growth. What happens if we get 10% growth for 30 or 40 or 50 years? What does the world look like? Do you have any idea? I certainly don't, but it's going to be fantastic, isn't it? It's going to be like the Jetsons, at the very least, yeah. I think it'd be better than the Jetsons. I think the Jetsons Mm -hmm. would look like crude, like a crude, poor society, right? Right. There's this problem in human psychology, which is that we have a great deal of loss aversion and very little sense of what gain would mean for us. We worry a great deal about losing the things we have, even if they're not very valuable. And we don't think very much about the benefits that we get 
from things improving all around us. And so we make bad decisions when thinking about these things. People get scared. They implement really terrible policies that ruin their cities, that ruin, you know, that ruin whole economies in an effort to preserve things. I and mean, the Europeans right now have decided in a big way to try to push to keep AI from happening. They don't refer to it that way, but they're basically making it very difficult to do AI research and AI deployment in Europe. We all already get to experience the joys of constant cookie and similar pop-ups on whenever we go to a web page, which mean nothing to us and don't benefit us in any way, thanks to the Europeans. Now maybe the Europeans will... I, I don't think that the Europeans will stop other countries that don't regulate AI from doing AI work, but it may very well be the case in that in, in 15 years, the Europeans are driving their own cars and Americans aren't because we have self-driving cars and they refuse to allow them and things mm -hmm. like that. The Germans recently, in order to improve the environment, I guess, stopped themselves from using nuclear reactors and started building more coal plants. Because naturally, the way to stop climate change is to increase your burning of coal. There's all sorts of irrationality people engage in when they start thinking badly about growth, about loss aversion versus gains and that sort of thing. And a lot of the AI discourse feels a lot like that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And it's shot through and through with economic fallacies, as you say, that it's the kind of thing where classic that in one little area, the innovation hurts temporarily the people who are producers in there, but it benefits everybody else. And so as that just starts popping, so the, the case for AI should be easier because it like it, there's so many applications all over that clearly people are going to benefit more from all the little improvement, not little, all the big improvements in all the areas of where they're spending their money versus the one, you know, the way that they currently right now make their money that, you know, it's like it just going to be a rising tide that lifts all boats. Yeah, the, the crude way of thinking of this is, oh, so we're going to have robots and so my factory will automate and I won't have a manufacturing job. That's a terrible way of thinking about it. The right way to think about it is we're going to have robots so we can make 10 times as much stuff. So I'll still have my job at the factory. It'll probably be a higher level, a nicer, less repetitive job. And suddenly, because we're making 10 times as much stuff, I can buy 10 times as much stuff per labor hour and I'm that much richer. Right. And that argument is very hard for a lot of people to understand because they haven't had an econ class. And if they have, they forgot everything about it after the final. But that's the more realistic view of all of this. The more realistic view is not that it's going to put us all out of jobs and we're all going to be miserable and starving while I don't know what will happen. Like the AIs will will be driving around, you know, in gold plated vehicles, you know, sneering at us as we starve at the side of the road. No, I mean, the AIs are tools, right? And they are tools that we will use in order to make ourselves wealthier. And so what's more realistic is that we will be having conversations like this in 20 or 30 years where everyone will be worried that the next generation of things is going to put everyone out of work. And, you know, everyone will forget how much wealthier they are because we'll have cured cancer and and dozens of other diseases and, you know, and we'll have even more wealth. But everyone will still think of themselves as horribly poor and think of bad old days as being the good old days. Yeah, they'll say, like, that's my job has been building these moon bases and they're going to put me out of work, you know. <laughs> so. Yes, well, just think about how badly people think about the past. I mean, you you look at... I say this a lot, but people look at television dramas and they look back at how people, how they think people lived in 1900 or 1800. And it's, oh, look, you know, all of those beautiful balls and those beautiful, and look at all the beautiful clothes they're wearing. They don't think to themselves, these people didn't have indoor plumbing. Right. Okay. In 1800, it didn't matter how rich you were. You had to go to the bathroom in a chamber pot or an outhouse. You didn't have any running water to wash your hands, all right? You know, you go down, you start thinking about it clearly. Right. And the bat, the good old days were not good at all. But of course, in 30 or 50 years, people will probably have nostalgia for now and think about how much better things were. And they'll be out of their minds, right? Just right, as we're right. out of our minds now when we think the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Or another one I like too is like, depending on what time period you're looking at, like if you wanted to hear music, you needed a bunch of musicians to come with their equipment and play it live for you because that was the only way you could hear a song. Wait so, a minute, wait a minute. You mean I couldn't just have, you know, <laughs> ordinary poor people couldn't just have lots of musicians following them around all day as they wanted to listen to music? It did not. Apparently not. A better yeah, so that's, by the time. way, that's yeah. another wonderful example of this. There are more mm -hmm. musicians now than there ever were before. 
But mm-hmm. music is now extremely cheap compared to the way it was before. Has this made the world worse? No. It's mean, meant that everyone who used to not have any access to music now has constant access to music. And the musicians are not worse off. They're now living, it, they're not only making more than they used to, even though, you know, being a musician is still not the best of, of professions in terms of how well it pays, and, and there aren't merely more musicians than there ever were before. But, you know, if you're a musician now, instead of in 1800, you have access to antibiotics and the internet and cell phones and running water and what have you. But there's another side of this that I should be fair and mention, which is that there are a lot of people who have convinced themselves that it's not even a question of economic growth or unemployment or things like that. There are people that have convinced themselves that AI is going to kill all of us. Well, yeah. That it's that, that, literally going to kill all yeah, of us. That's where I wanted to end on here because I, I want to respect your time here. But um, yes, the last topic is, and I've talked with some people, they're familiar, they're, they're not Luddites, in other words. They understand in general, yeah, innovation helps. And yeah, we, we're not, we're not making them. Oh, sh- sure. Okay. Fine. Fair enough. Fair enough. They're not worried that, yes, people are going to be thrown out of work. Their concern is, and I'll, I'll grab some of the more sophisticated ones, and I've even seen people saying, yeah, it, it's not like the Terminator. We're not worried about the machines like turning evil and hunting us down. Like, no, the problem is they say, if these things, once they get to be superhuman and they like start refining themselves, so like they develop their, they turn their faculties inward to improve their own intelligence, and it's just this runaway process, they're going to so far outstrip us that we're going to be, it's not that they're going to care one way or the other about us, but they might decide to use the, all the molecules on earth to build copies of themselves or to go, you know, take over other galaxies. That kind of thing. And we will just be like field mice to them. And that's not maybe a good spot we want to be in. Yeah. I mean, I've done thought experiments like this myself. And mm-hmm. one should keep in mind that fundamentally, Worrying about this is kind of silly and misguided, and I'll explain why. So there's the first question, which is, what does superhuman mean? Take a look around you. There are superhuman things all around you all the time. Your car has a superhuman ability to run or or to move, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot run or jog at 80 miles an hour down the highway for for four hours, right? And your car can without breaking a sweat Mm -hmm. or without caring. You cannot check millions and millions of tax returns or file them or or manipulate them or what have you, and the computers at the IRS can. You cannot predict the weather by doing vast, vast numbers of calculations uh, on all of the world's weather data. And even if you had 5,000 people working on it, it, it wouldn't be possible. The computers being used to do weather prediction are deeply superhuman. We even have things like superhuman chess machines and superhuman Go machines and things like that. Are you worried about these devices? Do they lie awake at night worried that you are obsolete because your car is capable of moving faster than you can? And you know, I am kind of worried about the IRS ones, but that's not really. What I you worry mean. about uh, yeah. about the IRS <laughs> becoming deeply superhuman. So the argument that then gets made by people on this sort of thing is, oh, this is very different. Because these are going to be systems that are capable of doing almost anything or anything that a human being can do, only vastly better. But why would they, why would we build them so that they have an independent volition to destroy us? And the argument that you will then get back from certain people is oh, it's not that we would build them that way, but that they would develop it mysteriously and magically on their own and they would deceive us into not realizing they had developed this capability or we wouldn't understand that they had de- I mean, there are all sorts of, of weird arguments that can be made. But they all come down to the notion that the AIs we build will have their own volition and own goals. And those goals will be radically incompatible with human goals and that they will then kill us. And why would we build machines like that? And, I mean, you can imagine doing it, right? I mean... You know, you can also imagine setting off nuclear weapons over the entire surface of the earth and sterilizing all life. We're capable of doing it, right? Would anyone do it? Not so much. You know, and if you tried to do it, other people would stop you, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. It turns out that single individuals can't build entire nuclear arsenals and decide to set them off. 
and that our societies build large numbers of checks and balances that prevent people who are crazy from from being able to independently to decide to do particularly awful things. And so you see arguments often from the Doomer faction and these, and I'm going to bluntly say these people are crazy. They're not necessarily literally insane in the sense of, of having no sense of like the world they're living in. They're not hallucinatory, but they're de facto crazy. And like there's an essay by Eliezer Yudkovsky where he has proposed that if we can't stop AI research in foreign countries, we should do aerial bombardment of their data centers. I mean, this is this goes a little bit past what's reasonable. But the argument that these people make often is, well, you know, once we build these systems and they start self-improving, by the next morning, they will be billions of times more intelligent than us and will have no control. And it's not even possible, right? It's not even something that could happen in principle. And over the longer term, you know, they say things like, well, you know, if you have AI systems, you will have AI militaries and you'll have AIs that are capable of designing horrible chemical weapons and diseases and what have you. And we're capable these days already of doing many of those things. And yet we haven't all died. And and why is that? Because we have checks and balances of power and we have mechanisms that prevent people from deciding to just go out and do terrible things. The over the long term, if we do this correctly, uh, yes, we will have governments or even possibly crazy individuals able to use AIs to design new diseases. And we'll also have the ability to design cures for diseases so quickly and defenses against new diseases so quickly that it, it won't make any difference. It won't be something that's salient. Uh, just as, you know, no one, if you had the only machine gun in ancient Rome and everyone else was armed with spears, it would probably give you a, a great deal of power and it would be a thing that people around you should be worried about. But if there are millions of machine guns in the world, you, the odds that you're going to be able to take over an entire country with one of them are pretty low. I am not worried that the development of this technology is going to either result in all life being wiped out or the human race suddenly vanishing in a, you know, as the AIs decide to change the, to turn the entire planet into paper clips. Paper clips is a common example people use in these discussions. It's an incoherent position. And if you look at the details of the arguments that are made about this, they are both at a high level and in detail, almost all riddled with errors. There's no particular reason to worry about it. There is reason to worry, however, that if we decide to overregulate the technology early in its existence, that we could end up in a situation where only the worst people have access to AI and use it for terrible things. That is legitimately a thing that could happen, right? If we decide that, that we are so worried about developing AI that we're going to leave it only in the hands of sociopathic dictators and dictatorial regimes, then I can guarantee, yes, mm -hmm. there will be bad results because people will not be able to use the technology for good and people who want to use it for ill will have no check on their bad behavior. The only thing that can stop a bad guy with super AI is a good guy with super AI, kind of. Well, I mean, what stops <laughs> bad guys with armies? That, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm, what I'm stopped, what on, like, stopped Vladimir Putin yeah, from rolling the over Ukraine, yeah, right? The gun control debates that, yeah, if, if you make guns criminal and only criminals have guns, sort of thing, yeah. Uh, or police forces, but mm. I repeat myself. Anyway, um, that was not nice of me. Anyway, but generally speaking, I mean, that's sort of a crude way of thinking of it, but it's not wrong, right? Mm -hmm. The societies develop ways of coping with these things over time. We develop ways of adjusting to stuff. We build cars and it turns out that the glass in the cars is really dangerous and then we invent safety. I mean, as people develop new technologies, they react to the technologies, they figure out what the pluses and minuses of the technologies are, and they improve them with time. The way that we will deal with the negatives of AI, and there will be negatives, right? Because there has been no technology developed in human history that hasn't had negatives. Everything's been an enormous net positive, but the same knife that you can use to help cook your dinner can be used to stab you in the gut, right? And it's a, it, 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 and you know, do we decide that we don't want to have knives? No, because 
they're too useful and the odds of something bad happening are relatively low, but there are bad things, right? The way we adjust as we develop new technologies to the bad things is by letting large numbers of people work on the problem, figure out ways to improve the situation, to make things safer, to develop countermeasures for negative uses of things, etc. And one of the problems with the Doomer faction is that they have this very, very silly view of how the world works, where they think that they can sit on their butts and think about how to make perfect AI or how we could develop AI in their minds more safely. And that eventually, if only smart enough people think for long enough periods of time, they will come up with the perfect way to do this. It's a sort of planning fallacy on steroids. You know, it's not a five-year plan from the Soviet Union. It's like, you know, some 500-year plan, mm -hmm. which makes it exponentially worse. That There's the way that we will cope with negatives is by engaging with them, which is the way we've coped with negatives of every previous technology. And it's the way that we will cope with the negative consequences of every future technology. And we still want the technologies. We still want the future technologies. And, but, you know, I mean, the, we can't, you cannot just have some group of bureaucrats or anointed smart people sit in the corner and predict every possible bad consequence and every possible way to counter it and every possible, it doesn't work, right? That's not yep. the way anything has ever worked. Yeah, well put. So I think that's probably a good point for us to wrap this discussion up. Uh, you so don't want to run for four hours? I understand I'm, Lex yeah. Friedman does, you know. <laughs> when we get the AI that can just hand it off, it can just copy our styles and then, and then to see where no, 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 the, the conversation the right, No, no, the, the way you deal with that appropriately is to have the AI that listens to the podcast so you don't have to suffer through four or five hours of it. <laughs> it can, it can listen to it on yeah. your behalf and then you don't have to. <laughs> well, folks, my guest has been Perry Metzger. Um, Perry, where can people go? I know you have some organizations you're affiliated with that are pertinent to these, uh, this discussion. Can well, you point I've people? got a startup, which is not entirely pertinent to the discussion, even though we're doing AI research. It's called Silenic, S-Y-L-E-N-I-C. And we don't really have a website because none of the stuff we are doing has been publicly released. But we're working on using AI to improve software quality by doing mathematical proofs of the correctness of software. It's a five-hour discussion all on its own. And I'm also have, you know, helped some with some other people have recently started a nonprofit that should have a website soon. We have not quite officially launched, should have happened over the Labor Day weekend, didn't quite, called Alliance for the Future. And that can be found at affuture.org. But it cannot be, it'll be found in a few days, not today, and probably not even today, the day that you release this podcast. Okay, well, great. So folks, if you listen to this a little bit after the release, then go check that link out. So my guest again has been Perry Metzger. Perry, thank you for your time. And thank you for having me, Bob. It's been fun. And, yes, and thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll see you next time. This concludes another episode of InFi, The Future of Finance with Dr. Robert Murphy. The information provided is for educational purposes and does not constitute financial advice. Consult with qualified professionals before making any financial or investment decisions. For more information on the host and for previous episodes, visit infithefutureoffinance.io. Thanks for listening.